uh, popular, interesting uh, conference on real world cryptography. And over the last uh, few years, I think there's a there's a best paper award in, in this top security conferences, which is dedicated to research done by, by Kenny and, and, and his team at CCS and, and Oakland. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> over the last few years, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased uh, that uh, he has accepted our invitation to come here, and, and I look forward to, to your talk, Kenny. Thank you. Thank you, Reza. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and, and the kind words. Um, it's actually very nice to come to a research week uh, exactly halfway through, in, through the time of being head of department at ETH because it gives me a chance to remember why I joined academia. It was not to be a head of department. It was because of the, the people that you get to meet and the research that you get to do. Uh, let me also explain that I had uh, quite a bad cold earlier this week and I'm still suffering a little bit. So I will talk quite quietly. Normally I'm much more blah, 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 but this morning I think I'll be a little bit more quiet and maybe easier to understand because of that. But I hope my voice survives. Uh, we'll take a little break in the middle as well so I can take some more, um, some more drugs. I don't recommend doing drugs in academia, but sometimes it's necessary. Um, not that kind of drugs, of course, just some simple medicines. Um, and um, of, of course, as usual, I'm very happy for this to be as interactive as you like. So if you have questions on the way through, please do stop me and uh, put your hand up, and, and I'll, I'll do my best to address your questions as we go along. Um, and uh, let's see. Let's see how that interactive part goes. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about cryptography in the wild. Um, it's maybe a little bit odd that we need to say in the wild uh, when we talk about cryptography because, you know, isn't cryptography used everywhere anyway? Why do you need to kind of give this demarcation in the wild when you talk about cryptography? And I hope that will become clear as we, as we go along. Um, so let me give you a sort of an agenda. I'm going to talk about how cryptography has spread in the wild. Then I'm going to talk about what do I mean by uh, the study of cryptography in the wild, how we do it. And then I've got two case studies for you, uh, one on Threema, which is a Swiss uh, messenger, uh, you know, something like Signal or WhatsApp, uh, but developed in Switzerland and used by the Swiss government. Um, and then the second one is something called Mega. Maybe some of you here know Mega. Any of you using Mega? I hope you're not using it for anything that's really sensitive or would be incriminating in a court of law. If you are, I would delete those files right away, and I'll explain why later. Okay. I'll talk about some challenges of this kind of research, of, of studying cryptography in the wild, uh, why to do it and why not to do it, why you might be better off doing something else, and then uh, we'll, we'll wrap up with a few concluding remarks. And I think I'll use the entire 80 minutes, actually, uh, especially if you ask lots of questions. Okay, good. So um, let's talk a little bit about the spread of cryptography in the wild. So once upon a time, Cryptography was used by emperors and generals and eventually by banks and by the military. But these days, cryptography is virtually everywhere. And here's a list of places where encryption and cryptography more generally is used these days. A lot of these are to do with secure communications. But in the second column, we get into more interesting things, more complicated things, uh, things like trusted platform modules and SGX, identity card systems, uh, digital rights management systems, and so on. And then the last column, we get to even more modern and kind of funky applications of cryptography, things like uh, cryptography for enabling privacy-preserving computation. So here, things like uh, privacy-preserving browser analytics in the Prio system appear. Here, you could also add things like fully homomorphic encryption, multi-party computation, and so on, and their use in things like crypto custody solutions. So cryptography uh, is, has been incredibly successful. It's been around for thousands of years. But in the last 20 years, I would say we've seen an explosion in the use of cryptography, and more and more complex cryptography is starting to be used in applications. It's no longer just the case of picking an encryption algorithm and then you know, maybe a stream cipher and then encrypting some data on a wireless channel. Uh, we're starting to use it for more and more complicated things. And with that, of course, comes some challenges and risks, and those are the kinds of things I want to talk about today. So here's a, a chart from Google from the Google Transparency Report. This is a couple of years old now, and it shows the growth of uh, the use of encryption um, across Google for encrypting traffic. And the chart, unfortunately, only goes, goes back to 2014. I wish it went back to about 2010, because things really changed for Google 
around, uh, when was it now, I guess uh, 2013 or so, when the Snowden revelations started to come out. And Google were directly uh, mentioned in some of the Snowden uh, revelations. Uh, you know, NSA had slides showing Google traffic being intercepted in the clear and hoovered up and analyzed. And Google's direct reaction to that was to start encrypting more of their traffic. And you can see the end of that process here on this chart. I don't know why they haven't reached 100%. Um, I should ask people I know at Google why that's the case. Uh, I'll get back to you on that question. Okay, so what is crypto in the wild? What do I mean by this, uh, this name? So what we're doing in this, in this work is finding interesting examples of cryptography that's being used in standards, for, you know, things like TLS, for example, or products. Um, or in deployed systems. So Mega would be an example of a deployed system with around 250 million users and thousands of terabytes of stored data where cryptography is very, very intimately uh, designed into the system. Then we analyze these systems or products or standards either to find vulnerabilities and then we try to do responsible disclosure or coordinated vulnerability disclosure or, or and in fact, both can exist at the same time, we, we take the cryptography that we find in the context of those systems, we build security models describing that cryptography and try to prove the security of the cryptography being used in those systems. Of course, this last step doesn't give you um, a perfect security guarantee because in the end it's only a model and we're only modeling certain parts of the system that have something to do with cryptography. But that by doing this process, you can, you can give some kind of uh, security assurance about the security of the deployed system. Okay, so um, along the way, of course, we want to write interesting research papers. Uh, we want to learn things about the state of deployed cryptography. We want to build relationships with vendors and uh, you know, have, have fun along the way, understanding how the subject that we love is getting used and abused in the real world. Okay, so um, just to give you a a counterpoint to this to tell you what cryptography in the wild is not about. It's not about developing new cryptographic primitives and pushing them towards practice. So it's not about the process of writing theoretical research papers with interesting new cryptographic concepts in them and then saying this would be useful for solving this problem and then taking it to a standards body or even launching a startup based on that. I think that's an extremely valuable activity and we need it. And that's the kind of traditional theory to practice transfer process that we're all very familiar with. But that's not what crypto in the wild is about. Okay, it's distinctive from that. It's about saying what is out there already, let's jump to the current practice and see what's going on there instead of trying to develop new theory and take it towards practice. Okay, so I'm not saying that uh, the, the traditional theory to practice transfer process is not good and not valuable. It clearly is. But what I'm saying is that in many cases, what we found is that cryptographic practice has got significantly ahead of or orthogonal to, out of line with cryptographic theory. Okay? And I'll illustrate that with the examples that I show you later. Um, and that kind of, for me, creates a kind of a head scratching moment to figure out well, why is that happening? Why is it that all of this great work that we do in publishing our cryptography conferences and our security conferences isn't getting through to developers. Why are developers doing crazy things with cryptography? And believe me, some of them are unbelievably crazy, unbelievably wrong, but they happen in huge systems. So we want to understand why that is. Okay, so this, is not, this talk is not denigrating theory in any way. It's recognizing the centrality and, uh, and, and the value of theory in everything that we do, but it's saying there is this thing happening out there in the world that it's useful to study. And maybe we can learn something by doing that. Does that make sense? Any questions at this point? Maybe if I invite questions, they'll start to flow. Okay, so if you're a theoretician doing cryptography, do not be offended by this talk. You're not a target of this talk. This is just saying there's another thing that we can also do, okay? There's more than one way to think about cryptography. Excellent, thank you. Good. So I wanted to just give you a flavor of some of the recent crypto in the wild projects that my group at ETH has been doing. 
And we're not the only people doing this kind of research. And on the next slide, I'll give a list of some of the other people working in this area. But I wanted to give you a flavor of what we've been doing. And on this slide, pink indicates a master's student project at ETH. So a special aspect of the work that we've been doing is the involvement of master's students in the process um, and them doing a lot of the heavy lifting of analyzing source code and reading through specifications and figuring out what's going on. And then, of course, implementing attacks, prototyping ideas, and so on. So um, it's, been, it's been fantastic. It's great training for master's students. Uh, and it's also very useful for the, the research endeavor to have them aboard. I, we couldn't do it without them. We just don't have the, the manpower. And here I've split this up across this kind of classical cryptographic triumvirate, the cryptographic triangle of data in transit, data at rest, and data under computation. So on the left-hand side, um, we have done a lot of analysis of secure communication systems. More, more recently, a lot of that has been um, messaging systems. So uh, Bridgeify here, for example. Telegram, I guess you all know. Anybody using Telegram? Yeah, you should stop using Telegram as well, right? <laughs> it's not end-to-end -end secure by default. And it has no end-to-end -end secure option for groups. So if you have a small group of friends and you're communicating about where you're going to meet up to overthrow the government, all of your data can be read by the server. Okay? So please stop using Telegram. And I recommend, if you want a concrete recommendation, use Signal. Signal is good. Okay, good. Um, so we had a paper on Telegram at IEEE Security and Privacy 2022 where we, we broke Telegram uh, and we also uh, repaired it and showed how to prove it secure, even though it uses a lot of very odd cryptography. Uh, Bridgeify is an interesting one. It's, a, it's an ad hoc messenger. So it's a messenger that uses only Bluetooth communication. And Bridgeify repeatedly advertised itself as being appropriate for use by protest groups, people who really were trying to overthrow their government or protest against their government in places like Hong Kong and Myanmar and Nigeria and so on. And they claimed it was secure, and we completely broke it, right? It's totally and utterly broken. The first time in a paper at CTRSA in 2021 by Martin Albrecht and his group, and then we looked again after they had repaired it and found that it was still completely broken. So they had integrated signal into their, into their protocol, but they had done it in a way which uh, still enabled attacks to be carried out. Uh, and then there's a long list of other ones here. Threema I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so there's a bunch here in this area. Then for data at rest, <coughs> we looked at Mega, which is this huge cloud storage system that I'll talk about later in the second case study. And recently, we also looked at Nextcloud, which is the next largest such system available. Uh, it, has, it only has a few dozen million users, but it has a lot of corporate users in Europe. And it's open source. And it was completely broken. So they added end-to-end -end encryption. And they did it in such a way that it was trivial for the server to induce users to use the wrong public keys when communicating with each other. And then the, the attacker could easily learn all of the file encryption keys. Uh, and the attack is really simple, kind of beautiful, but it came from a fundamental misunderstanding of what properties public key encryption can give you. Public key encryption can give you confidentiality, but it doesn't have any integrity guarantees that it, or proof of origin guarantees. And a, a, a PKE ciphertext can come from anybody. So if it, if it claims to come from Alice, it could have come from the server. Okay? And that's the basis of our, one of our attacks against NextCloud. Uh, everything, by the way, here I'm mentioning is fully disclosed and has been patched. Obviously, we have other work in progress that I can't really talk about here where, you know, um, because of uh, responsible disclosure or work underway, I can't really tell you about it. But there's, this picture will grow. Then there's data under computation. And here I'm thinking about things like fully homomorphic encryption, searchable encryption, all of those more advanced cryptographic primitives that we're all very excited about and doing research on. And here, uh, the main one we've looked at is MongoDB, queryable encryption. So MongoDB, as you know, is a large database vendor. And they recently launched a product that integrated searchable encryption into their database system. Um, yeah, and we broke it. Um, and then I didn't know where to put these ones, but we also did some research on uh, cryptocurrencies uh, because they use some really interesting cryptography these days. And I've got to be honest with you, one of my main motivations for starting to look at cryptocurrencies is because the bug bounties are so large. You're allowed to laugh, right? It's like, you know, it's okay. Uh, 
Um, uh, I mean, there are bug bounties here of like $500,000 being paid out for finding a simple bug in a crypto library. Um, so if you want to get rich, go bug hunting in, in, in Web3 land, uh, and you can do very well. Of course, there's competition, um, but uh, you, 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 you can make a very nice income there. So um, yeah, we have a couple of interesting results there that, I'll, that I won't talk about today. So this gives you kind of a flavor of what we've been doing, and I'm going to talk about a couple of these as case studies. But before I move on, let me mention we're not alone. Oh, there's a question. You know that's what the rest of my talk is about. Methodology. Yeah, I'll come to that. Great, thanks for the question. Um, so we're not alone, and here's a partial list of people who are also working in this area. And if your name is not here and you think it should be, I apologize. I mean, Hotec, I didn't know you were coming today. Thanks for coming. Hotec worked on TLS analysis with me for a few years ago. Uh, Stefano has done great work in uh, looking at um, format-preserving encryption schemes, for example, from the NIST standards. Uh, and of course, Jonathan has worked a lot on TLS security. So there's lots of other people whose names you know, could be here. So it's just a partial list. But I think it's fair to say that for nobody on this list, is this the only thing that they do? So we're all part-timers when it comes to doing crypto in the wild. For nobody is it yet a full-time job, I would say. Um, so where does the term or crypto in the wild come from? And I was giving a kind of practice version of this talk in Vienna a couple months ago, and I thought I'd better find out where did this term come from. So I, I messaged Martin Albrecht, who's one of my big collaborators in this area, and I said, what's the origin of that phrase? And I said, I seem to recall you came up with it when we were first formulating joint supervision of master students at ETH, but maybe it goes back further. And Martin replied, I thought it was your phrase. And then I said, oh, OK, fine. Um, and notice here we're using Signal. So this is an implicit recommendation to stop using Telegram and start using Signal. Okay, Good. So um, I thought I'd better dig a little bit deeper. And of course, I dug deeper by Googling. And I found this talk by Nick Sullivan. So Nick at this time was at Cloudflare, um, which many of you will know as a company. He was the head of cryptography at that time. Then he later became the chief scientist, I think, of, uh, of Cloudflare. Um, he gave a talk called Cryptography in the Wild in 2019, in December 2019. But then I went a little bit further, and I found this beautiful PhD thesis by Igor Stepanovs, who actually was a postdoc with me after his PhD, uh, called Theoretical Foundations of Cryptography in the Wild. So you see, the theoreticians can't leave it alone. You know, they always have to. You know, it's a it's a very nice thesis, um, and you can download a copy from Igor's website. And there's a a, a picture of Igor's uh, to remind you who he is. Um, so I think this is the earliest use of the phrase I could find. But crypto in the wild, and here crypto means cryptography. Okay, not anything else. Okay, so now to come to the question: How do we decide what to look at, and how do we do it? What do we do? How do we do it? So. The target selection process has a bunch of criteria. We always have our eyes open for news articles, for blog posts, for interesting new companies starting up. Um, and what we're looking for is the use of non-trivial and or non-standard cryptography. Right? So if a company is doing something really standard and boring, it's probably not worth us looking at. We're not going to find anything interesting. Um, we're interested in the size of the user base. So for us, Telegram was very interesting because it has now more than 700 million users. So if you find a vulnerability in Telegram, it's potentially quite impactful. It will, it will affect a lot of users. And what's more, if you get it fixed, it will improve the security of a lot of users at the same time. So the size of the user base is an important criterion for us in, in target selection. But actually, sometimes uh, a user base can be very small, but we still care a lot. And here, Bridgeify is the perfect example. Bridgeify claimed to have about 5 million users. But that was just based on downloads. That doesn't tell you how many active users you have. It's probably much smaller. But they made extreme claims about the security of their system. And they really implicitly recommended it for use by protesters protesting against governments who potentially would throw them in prison and, in some countries, execute them. Um, and so here, we felt that this app and the company behind it was actually putting people's livelihoods and maybe even lives at risk. And so we decided to, to analyze that one, even though it's quite a small user base. Local importance, and this is where uh, Threema comes in. So I mentioned that Threema was being used by 
uh, the Swiss, or was recommended by uh, the Swiss government. In fact, it was mandated that Threema must be used by the Swiss military as the only messaging app. And we're a Swiss federal research institute, so we felt compelled to take a look. So local importance. Then, uh, coming to your question, I think, directly, it's really helpful if the source code is available or if it's easy to reverse engineer and it's legal to reverse engineer. And legality of reverse engineering in Switzerland is slightly a gray area. In some countries, it's much clearer. Um, so often we would uh, pick targets where the source code is available to us to make life much easier. And sometimes you only have the source code for a client because you're downloading JavaScript into your browser. And then maybe the JavaScript is obfuscated, but you can use deobfuscation tools to get through that and get to the underlying code. And we don't have the server code at all. Often that's the case. So you have to, to do an attack uh, against uh, a certain system. You might have to rebuild the server based on the client functionality. Then it helps if there's a white paper that describes the crypto architecture, because then you can use that to guide you through the source code. Now I see hands going up. Do you want to go first? Yeah. Second yeah. Yeah. No. Absolutely. This is a good question. So many systems actually out there in the wild are designed without really having a specification. Yeah. So it doesn't matter that there's no specification because there never was one. No, but right. But. Yeah. 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 Oh, I see. Okay. So, I mean, you, you, of course, you build a kind of test framework where you run the unmodified client, say, with a simulated server. If the attack is meant to be, say, say the attack involves an untrusted server attacking a client, then it's okay. The server can do any functionality it likes. Right, because it's untrusted. It doesn't have to follow the specification any longer. So your, your server implementation doesn't have to be exactly the same as the actual server, which you never had access to anyway. And then you run an unmodified client and do the attack against that in your experimental framework. Right? So it's non-trivial, but it's doable. Also, like, you look at the standard library implementation of a lot of these protocols, it was like... The what? Sorry? The standard library implementation of these things. Because like, usually people use Office as like, and they're sometimes not well analyzed. What do you mean by standard library? Like OpenSSL or something like that? Or yeah, 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 absolutely. So what we've seen over the last few years is a shift towards systems that use crypto libraries and they use good crypto libraries. And so the, the basic algorithms are good. But what they did was they built their own protocol or system out of those libraries. And then they combined the components in such a way that they're not secure. Yeah. So uh, often we're not attacking the underlying algorithm. We're not breaking SHA-256, because hey, that's really hard. We're not even breaking some weak hash function, although sometimes that does happen. In some recent work, we found some system that was using Marmor hash in a, not in a cryptographic context, but in a potentially adversarial setting. And then the invertibility of Marmor hash made our attacks much easier, for example. But mostly it's nowadays for us and the work that we do, it's at the level above the algorithm level. Yeah, exactly. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think you also had a question. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just out of curiosity. You yeah. were mentioning that reverse engineering in some cases is legal. Uh, ah. And I was puzzled by that because, I mean, the kind of exploration and study that you do on the market, how can it be illegal and where is it illegal? I think uh, for certain types of reverse engineering in the United States, it's uh, legally very unclear. And there have been... What's it called? The digital DCMA uh, had a big effect on, but I don't know if that's still in force. All, all I'm saying is I don't know. Sorry? Yeah, I know DCMA doesn't, but I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is that I am not sure what the situation is in Switzerland. It's, for me, it's a gray area. I am not a lawyer. I cannot afford a lawyer, so I'm not going to go there in most cases. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. There's a question here. Yes. Yes. I'll give you an example. Skype. Yeah. The old one. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So. 
So it's a, it's a really good, no, so let me just respond directly to that, and I, I want to move on because I have a lot of slides. Um, it's, the thing about obfuscation is it's actually a disincentive for us to do the analysis because it adds multiple layers and of uncertain difficulty. At the outset, you don't know how hard it's going to be to de-obfuscate. So security through obscurity works against us, right? But that doesn't mean that the source code isn't sitting somewhere on some server that can be hacked and stolen and then analyzed. So overall, I'm not saying security by obscurity is a good thing. I'm not breaking Kirchhoff's principle. I'm just saying that in practice, obfuscation acts as a disincentive to analysis. It slows us down. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, true. It's not cheap. Yeah, yeah, true. Okay, let's move on. Um, then another criterion for us is the strength and credibility of the security claims made by the vendor. Vendors make incredible security claims, and I'll show you some in a few slides' time. Um, it's very common to make claims about zero-knowledge security, meaning we don't see user data. Not zero-knowledge in the sense that you think, right? Um, or military-grade communication security. Whatever that means, means nothing. And so on, and so on, and so on. And these are marketing terms, of course. And they're not aimed at us as researchers, but they act as a, I wouldn't say a red flag, I would say an orange flag, right? Um, because it sort of indicates that maybe they don't really know what they're doing cryptographically if they're willing to say things like that in public. Because you don't need to say things like that to sell your product. And then finally, smell. Does it smell good or bad? Okay. And then, of course, um, we need excellent ETH master students who are willing to play. And there are lots of those, thank goodness. Okay, so how do we do it now? So come to methodology. And this slide is almost a joke. It can be interpreted as a, an elaborate joke, but this is really what we do. This is our methodology, okay? And it's not very sophisticated, I'll, I'll admit that. And probably there are people in the room who could automate us out of existence. I would be very happy to see that happen. Okay, so let me say what the methodology is. When we're in attack mode, we define the target system, we develop the relevant threat models, what does it mean to break the system? We read the white paper and the code, if they're available, and then we do the following. We build pseudocode models describing the cryptographic core of what's going on. We do this for two reasons. One, it forces us to focus on what is it we're actually analyzing and not get distracted by too many details, and two, this is where I come in, right? Because I don't, I, I'm not very good at reading code and building pseudocode models, but if you give me a pseudocode model, I can say, here's 27 different things you should try, right? And probably these three are the first ones to try against this particular thing, just from experience, right? So there's experience involved here. Maybe that's the hard part to automate, I don't know. Uh, then we come up with attacks, and then we build and test proof of concepts for the attacks in the sort of sort of framework I talked about in answer to your question. And we do that until we have found enough attacks, and then we write a research paper and more or less in parallel run a disclosure process. Okay, and I added this slide because often when we write these research papers and submit them, the program committee comes back and says, but you didn't explain what your methodology was. And there was a one, there's like always one sentence in our paper is the methodology is that we explored the source code in the white paper and we found attacks and then we tested them, which is like the shorthand version of this because that's what we actually do, okay? So you can say this is not, not very scientific, it's not very generalizable, uh, this is not science. I don't care about any of that because we're doing crypto in the wild, right? Um, I guess the problem is when you run into the scientific review process, it can get a little bit frosty out there sometimes. On the other hand, as Reza mentioned, we also win Best Paper Awards. So when you get through the scientific process, people like your paper when it gets published. So it's, it's an interesting superposition, let's say, of situations. Okay, so here are sources of attacks. So this is like, if you like, my, some of my experience distilled onto a single slide. What kinds of things do we look for in code and you know, the pseudocode uh, when we're looking for attacks? Uh, so I'm just going to go quickly through these. I'm not going to even read them all out. There's a big long list of things that you can look for that you know are pri probably going to cause problems at some point, okay? Uh, and here's, here's my list, and you can add to this. So 
Take a picture of this if you want to get into the game, because these are the things you need to learn how to do. I'll step aside so you, people are literally photographing it. That's great. Yeah, and this is not complete either, but it's it's a good it's a good starting point. These are things to look for. Okay, <clears throat> what if we're in proof mode instead of uh, attack mode? The process is very similar. The first few steps are identical. We go into a do loop, which also Im involves building pseudocode models of the cryptographic core. And this is where the gap between the actual running system and our models exists, because here we're building a model which doesn't capture all the functionality. Then we develop suitable security models. And here there's some experience and skill involved in knowing what to model and what not to model, and how faithful to be, and what you can ignore. And being honest about what you're ignoring as well, of course, is very important. And then we write security proofs. Of course, that takes some skill and expertise too, right? It's not trivial just to start writing security proofs. And we do that until we've generated enough proofs. And then we write a research paper. And then we submit it to a conference. OK, so proof mode and attack mode. Now, you might wonder, how do you choose between them? How do you know what to do? Well, in fact, you exist in a superposition of attack mode and proof mode, and you start looking. So you basically run the process here until you reach the second bullet point in the do loop, where you either develop suitable security models and proofs, or you find attacks. And sometimes you do both. Okay, You can find an attack. You can write down a model, and you can find an attack that's just outside of the model, but maybe isn't that relevant in practice, or isn't that severe, or whatever. Okay. And so usually what happens is at some point, this superposition collapses into one of the two states, and you go down that route. Yes? How do you capture the experience attack that you're looking at against the red point? Because it's very modular. Like it depends on how you're designing the system. And you're saying that we don't often have it. In the proof model. Oh, in the proof model, you mean? Ah, oh, no, that's really complicated. Yeah. So your question is, uh, how do you know? Oh, OK. How do you find attacks that are outside of the model? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. You don't. I mean, it's part part of the art of cryptography is knowing uh, somehow where to draw the line when you're building a model. Because the more complex the model, the harder the proofs are to do, and the more likely you'll make a mistake somewhere in the proof, unless you have some automated proof tools. And then you know you might switch from doing game-based security, hand-rolled game-based security proofs over to some more kind of automated analysis using tools like Tamarin, for example. So you might switch to a symbolic view of cryptography to capture a bigger system. So there are different tools available for different system scales that you're looking at. But there's no, you're right, there's no hard and fast rule here. So there's that kind of edge where it's not clear. Uh, it's not clear how comprehensive your model is and what might be just outside of your model. And there are famous examples of this, let, let me just briefly say. Um, going way, way back, there's a very famous paper by Bilaro, Bilari, Kono, and Namprimpre from 2002 at CCS, where they proved the security of the SSH symmetric encryption scheme. But they did it by, they did it, and it's a beautiful analysis, and it introduced very useful tools that have been used all over symmetric, crypto, symmetric cryptography ever since. But they missed one critical feature of the SSH protocol which was that it had an, a length field describing the length of packets, and that length field itself was encrypted. And that length field didn't appear anywhere in their analysis. And then in 2009, we wrote a paper that broke SSH using that encrypted length field as, a, as an attack vector in some way. So there can be a tiny little thing that you miss out that means everything falls apart. That's not to completely diminish that paper by Bilaric BKN, because actually, it can, as I mentioned, it contains things like stateful security models for symmetric encryption, which have proven to be very useful ever since. Stefano. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, for example, in our analysis of Telegram, to get the proofs to go through, we had to make new uh, related key assumptions about the block cipher underlying SHA-256, which hold in the ideal cipher model, but they provide new targets for cryptanalysis. Right? Do, these, do these assumptions hold in practice? And that, came, that was unavoidable because of the way that Telegram derives its keys, or in fact doesn't derive its keys properly. They use this thing where they have like, they just take raw Diffie-Hellman key bits and then they 
and the, even the key bits are overlapping for the different keys in different directions. So you have kind of correlated keys on a secure channel. And that required new secure channel definitions to cope with um, you know, the possible in bad interactions between these related keys in, in different directions on the channel. Yeah, so that does happen too. Yes? Sure. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Right, right. So that, that is not, yeah, everything is good except the, you know, novelty factor is yeah. nothing Yeah. But, but it's all the rest of stuff that's very useful. Yeah. But, but that's not our job. Great. That's a great point. And then program committees say, this lacks novelty. Right. <laughs> and that's really distressing for my master students. <laughs> but, it's also, but it's also part of the game, right? Because you could say, this isn't valid science. Because the companies behind these products should be doing this for themselves. But they're not. Ask yourself why. Why don't they do this? Because it requires a certain amount of skill and time, and they just want to launch a product on the market. right? So they have time to market pressure and all of that kind of stuff. So you're absolutely right that... that their quiz, sorry? And they're changing their quiz. Yeah, all the time it's changing. So they don't even have a specification that is, that's stable enough to, to develop a proof against. Absolutely right. So, so there is this debate in my mind, and also with all of these referees that I interact with through rebuttal processes about, is this science? And is this what we should be doing with our time? OK? And I want to con try to convey to you that I think it is worth doing, because there are hundreds of millions of users using bad cryptography, and in some small number of cases, whose lives are at risk. And so we should do this kind of research. And uh, later on, if I ever get there, I have slides saying why you should do this. So maybe I'll save those bullet points for there in answer to that question. Yeah. Sorry? Sometimes. Uh, for the Threema paper, uh, was accepted to Usenix security, but um, only after I wrote a very strong rebuttal explaining why there was a long tradition of analyzing specific systems at Usenix. And I gave them lots of examples, including some of my own papers, um, to say, look, this is what we do at Usenix Security. And then they seem to, I'm not sure if that was a critical argument in favor of the paper was eventually accepted. They forced us to rewrite it in a way that made the paper worse. But you know, that's also part of the publication process, right? Your paper sometimes ends up worse than um, you think it needs to be. But anyway, OK, so we looked at this slide. Uh, so I'll come back to that point. Um, it's, a great, it's a great point, very valid. OK, so yeah, we're in this kind of situation. I don't know if you've seen this before. I quite like this. Um, the bowls are both intact and broken at the same time. This seems somehow relevant for cryptography. In fact, those bowls are definitely broken at some point in the future. right? And I think that's almost always the case. OK, so first case study, a little bit behind schedule. This is about Threema. And this paper, as I mentioned, appeared at Usenix Security. We wrote a nice web page about it as well with like an informal uh, um, description of all the work. And here I've got, I, put, I put this picture because this is the one that appeared in the newspaper in Switzerland when, when the newspaper reported on it. And if you look very closely, you can see in my eye, in, my, in the lens of my spectacles, is reflected the Threema logo. And this is me staring hard at Threema, trying to break it. Right? That's the, what it's meant to convey. I thought that was pretty nice. Nice idea. They put me in a dark room in order to take this photo. And it took quite a long time to get it right. And it makes me look pretty aggressive. That's not me, right? I mean, it is me, but that's not, you know, this is not who I am. Well, I kind of is, actually. It's like, anyway. OK, so let's talk about Threema. So uh, first released in 2012, uh, it's Swiss, and it's very proud of being Swiss, 100% Swiss made. Um, you could argue Swiss cheese is also 100% Swiss made, and it's full of holes. Um, OK, it uh, hosts its own servers in Switzerland. And so unlike US services, it is fully GDPR compliant and not subject to the Cloud Act, which I think enables the US government to come and take your data. Right? So it's not subject to that. So OK, this is all good. Um, who is using it? Well, in, in October, they had about 11 million users, according to their website. But what's more interesting is the, the large companies and governments that use Threema. And here's a, here's a few of them. Deutsche Bank, 
the Swiss government is the top left, Emirates, Airlines, Mercedes-Benz, and this guy, this is Olaf Scholz, who is the Chancellor of uh, Germany, so like the Prime Minister of Germany at the moment, uh, and there he is staring at a phone, and apparently, according to this news article, he uses Threema because it offers, what does it say? Uh, the pioneer, this is, I'm translating roughly from the German, the, the pioneer of end-to-end -end encryption, uh, Gilt als besonders sicher, guarantees uh, special security. Uh, for that reason, Threema is winning more and more um, corporate customers. Uh, even the Bundeskanzler is using the app. Okay, so good. It must be worth attacking if the German Chancellor is using it. Right? Um, so uh, we, we decided to analyze Threema. I should mention at the time when we started, Kian was a master's student in my group, supervised by Matteo, who was already a PhD student, and me. Uh, and Kian is now a full-fledged PhD student with me. So he did such a great job that I thought, I can't miss this guy. Let me, uh, let me offer him a PhD studentship. Okay, so we analyzed in three different threat models. So the first threat model is just the external actor who can observe communications between the mobile phone, the client, and the server. This is the standard man-in-the-middle or machine-in-the-middle attacker. Then, slightly stronger, because the system is claiming to have end-to-end -end security, we can consider what happens if the server itself has been compromised or is malicious in some way. So what can the server learn from its special position observing the end-to-end -end encrypted communications? And the final threat model we consider as the strongest of all is compelled access. So here, imagine you're going through a border and the border control agents take your phone off you and force you to unlock it. What can they learn? Of course, they can probably read any messages that are in your app. But for example, can they extract additional information that would enable them to read your older messages that have been deleted or to read your future messages that have not yet even been sent? Okay, and I won't talk about this attack here today, but there's a trivial attack against Threema in the compelled access setting because it has a feature which allows a user to very quickly from the app menu export their long-term private key in the form of a QR code. And with that long-term private key, you can read all messages, as the server, at least. So the server is able to read all of the messages. And we have another attack which enables a, a man-in-the-middle attacker to also read all messages once they have the long, uh, if they have the long-term private key of the user. So you could say that's a feature. I would also say it's a security issue, right? And other apps don't allow that kind of key export, uh, or other messaging apps don't allow that kind of key export capability because it's too risky, I would say. Yes, you had a question. Does it also have a web client? Does it have a? Yes, absolutely, yeah. Threema has a web client, and it has a, a web app, and it has, yeah, exactly, yeah. Android and iOS. Yeah, question here? Yeah. So maybe something Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting question. So sometimes you arg end up arguing with an organization or a company or a vendor, or let's put it more positively, educating a vendor about what their threat model should be. So for example, when we engaged in discussion with Threema, they didn't like this threat model. They considered it too strong. But for us as cryptographers, this is standard by now to understand what happens if I break into your device, how much damage can I do? You can't expect everything to remain secure after I break into your phone. But maybe deleted messages shouldn't be recoverable, for example. And here they would be. Okay? So it, it, it's, a, it's a process of discussion and sometimes education to agree on what is the right threat model for a given app or a given situation. Okay, good. So uh, yeah, that's the threat model. Here's the high-level view of Threema. Uh, it has an end-to-end -end encryption protocol between Alice and Bob, and also has a client-to-server communication protocol. And this is pretty standard. A lot of apps here for the client to server, a lot of messaging apps for the client to server protocol would use TLS, or they might use WireGuard, or some other kind of simple client to server 
uh, secure communication protocol, um, they, Threema, rolled their own protocol here. And we'll look at it in detail in a few slides' time. Um, all of the security is based on long-term key pairs generated by Alice and Bob at the time when they register for the service. So each of Alice and Bob has a long-term key pair, SKA, PKA, SKB, PKB, and these are actually Curve 25519 key pairs, or just think of them as Diffie-Hellman key pairs, if you know. Does everybody know Diffie-Hellman key exchange? Pretty much, right? Basic crypto class. So just think Diffie-Hellman here. There are, some there are some details of our attacks where the fact that it's Curve 25519 actually matters and enables us to do things better, um, but we won't get into that today. Okay, so let's look at the end-to-end -end protocol. It's very simple. Alice and Bob both run the shared Diffie-Hellman calculation to generate, generate a key, and then they use that key to encrypt their data. Okay, and I'll explain uh, in a slide or two the details of the um, encryption algorithm that's used, but for a moment, just focus on this key. What do you notice about this key between Alice and Bob? What did I say about the nature of SKA, PKA, and SKB, PKB? Sorry? That's true, there's no authentication, yeah? So actually, for this to be secure, we have to rely on the server to distribute Bob's public key to Alice and Alice's public key to Bob in an authentic manner. Uh, they can also, I think in Threema, they have some kind of key fingerprints that can be compared. There's no authentication, but there's another feature here, which is that these keys are long-term static keys. They're generated once and then used forever. What this means in particular is there's no forward security and there's no post-compromise security from the end-to-end -end protocol itself. Okay, so in particular, the server, which sits in the middle of the communication between Alice and Bob, sees messages encrypted under this key. If that key ever leaked, or if SKA or SKB ever leaked to the server, it could read all of the messages, past and future, and there's no way to recover. This is far, far away from what modern uh, secure communications protocols or messaging, messaging protocols like Signal will do. Essentially, in Signal, for every message that you send from Alice to Bob or Bob to Alice, you have a new key that's generated by ratcheting the old keys using uh, something called the double ratchet, okay, which is a much more secure way of doing things and has much better security guarantees. So this is what you might call generously old school. Yes? Yeah, I'll come to that. Yeah. I, I just want to understand whether is it deliberate they choose to not press anything or do they not know that they're pressing? What happened is the following. I'll address this. It was first released in twenty twelve. And in twenty twelve ratcheting wasn't really a known thing. And they designed it then and then the crypto didn't really change. Not in a detailed way, not in a, a complex way. They made some small changes which I'll show you, but not, not big changes. So the design was stuck in 2012. And this is a big problem in general. If you're going to deploy cryptography at scale, you better get it right, because it's hard to update in flight. Right? It's like repairing the engine of the airplane while the airplane is flying. It's quite a hard thing to do. Or the door flies off or something. So anything can happen these days. OK, I should go a little bit more quickly, because it's already 10.50. I have half an hour left. OK, let's see. So this is weak. Here's the message format of the end-to-end -end protocol. So on the top right is the thing that we encrypt. So we have our message content, hello world. We have some padding bytes. And here we use PKCS7 padding. Uh, and that's a random amount of padding between 1 and 256 bytes. Okay? And then we have a message type field, single byte 01. And I mention this because it will be important later. Okay? So the shortest amount of padding you could have would be 01, single byte. OK, and then we use an authenticated encryption scheme. It's actually ChaCha20 Poly1305. So that, at the time, was quite a modern scheme. This is a, a good choice. It's a non-spaced encryption scheme, if you know about non-spaced encryption. Um, and um, yeah, and then we do this encryption process using our key K from the end-to-end -end protocol, and that gives us our encrypted messages. 
So obviously, if you can recover the key, you can decrypt these messages. There's also metadata that we need to send along with the message. Uh, this metadata is going to be encrypted by the client to server protocol, but it will be available to the server, and the server needs it so that it can forward the message. So it will say, who is this message for? Bob's identity will be mentioned in here if the message is for Bob, and so on. Okay, but later they realized that this metadata is unprotected, which means it can be manipulated by the server if the server is an adversary. So the server can change the timestamps, for example, and make the messages be delivered out of order. Okay, so they decided what they would do is they would add a second layer of protection for some of the metadata, but the only tool they had available was authenticated encryption, so they used it again, but they didn't want to use the same key because they knew that using the same key twice was a bad idea, I think. So they derived another key from K and then used a second instantiation of the authenticated encryption scheme with the same nonce to generate what's called a metadata box, which encrypts some of the metadata. They don't want an encryption capability here for the metadata. The metadata is meant to be in the clear. They wanted integrity, but the only way they could get integrity was by using this authenticated encryption scheme. So this is about what happens when, you're, when you choose a crypto library that doesn't have all of the functionality that you want. And here they were using NACL, the NACL crypto library. So can anybody see what's wrong with this from a theoretical perspective, at least from a theory perspective? They're using the same nonce? Yeah, that looks bad, right? You should never reuse nonces in authenticated encryption. But here, the same nonce is used twice, but with different keys. Right, because the second key is derived by putting the first key through a KDF. So it turns out that nonce reuse is not a problem here. But there are, there are other problems with nonce as well, which I'll explain briefly in a moment. Anybody else? Yes, Stefan. Uh, I know. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah, exactly. So the key is being used for two things: once to encrypt, and once as a key deriving key. This is a key reuse vulnerability, which makes it kind of impossible to formally prove anything about this, right? Because you should really have a, you should apply the KDF with two different labels to make the two different keys. What they actually need is AEAD, authenticated encryption with associated data, but the crypto library didn't support that. So they had to bodge it by doing this. Now, very briefly on nonces, since you mentioned them, here, normally in, in a protocol like Signal, the nonce can just be a counter, and the nonce is then used to enforce message ordering. Here, for some reason, well, one of the reasons is that in the end-to-end -end protocol, they use the same key in two different directions, okay? Uh, which means that you have to avoid nonce reuse in the two different directions, but you can't do that if the nonces are counters because probably they end up overlapping with each other. So what they do is they make all the nonces to be randomly chosen. But then to check for replays of nonces, they have to store all the nonces that have ever been used in either direction on the secure channel in a database. And if you reinstall the app on Android, you keep the same key, but you lose the database. So replays become possible if a user ever reinstalls the app, okay? This is really bad. And this is not really how you're meant to use non-space cryptography. It's not how it was envisaged that it should be used. So many, many issues flow from this construction, but not really any significant attacks. The last thing I want to say is that for backwards compatibility, the metadata box is anyway optional. So the, the, the server as adversary can just strip off the metadata box and manipulate the metadata, and the client will accept the message anyway. So you can do, the server can do trivial reordering attacks against the end-to-end -end protocol and can change the semantics of a sequence of messages by changing the order of the messages. This is a disaster, okay? This is trivial to avoid with a well-designed protocol and they didn't manage to avoid it. Okay, but let me show you something much more interesting. Let me show you the client-to-server protocol. Ah, oh, there's a question, Jonathan. Yeah. 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 The the company at that point was very small, 
there's one guy in his bedroom and there's one other guy, literally, because I, I met them and talked to them. And they just didn't really have the deep crypto expertise. In fact, they did a surprisingly good job considering uh, the kind of starting point that they were at. You know, the smart people. Just access to information. Access to information. Access to tools at the yeah, time. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think AED was pretty new still even then. So maybe it wasn't that well understood as the kind of go-to primitive for this kind of thing. Maybe it was only, so it takes time for the kind of knowledge that we have to reach this wider uh, developer community. Okay, so let's talk about the C2S protocol. Gosh, I really need to move fast. Okay, um, so I'm gonna give you a simplified version of the protocol. Uh, all the details are in our paper. Um, the client and the server want to establish a session key and authenticate. And so they're going to generate ephemeral key pairs. So these are like one-time use keys uh, on both sides. So these are called E SKA and E SK, E PKA and so on. So E for ephemeral meaning short term. But we also have these long term keys. And now we have the server's long term key pair as well. As well as Alice's long term key pair. So we have got four sets of keys involved. And we're going to exchange the ephemeral keys. And then we're going to do this. We're going to make a session key by combining the two ephemeral values. We're going to make something called a vouch key by combining the long-term values, so the long-term here, the long-term private key of Alice, and the long-term public key of Bob. And then we're going to create something called a vouch box by encrypting, using this vouch key, the ephemeral public key. Because the idea is the ephemeral public key is like a one-time thing, and so if we encrypt that and use the integrity properties of the encryption mechanism, it's this AE scheme again, then only somebody who knows the key could create this ciphertext, right? That's the idea. And so this encrypted vouch box, well, of course, now it's encrypted under the session key to protect it, and it's sent across, and now the, the, the server will decrypt, will, will also create the session key, will decrypt this ciphertext here, recover the vouch box, and check that the vouch box was correctly constructed, okay? And this provides some kind of client to server authentication. It's proving somehow, meant to prove somehow, that the client knows uh, its long-term private key. Okay, good. Uh, and then they start using the session key to encrypt their messages in the client to server protocol. So the session key is used both for that initial encryption and also in the channel itself. And I missed out a lot of details here about nonces and all kinds of other things. It's not quite as bad as it looks here. So Jonathan, go ahead. Yeah, I, I missed it out. The, the dot, dot, dot there means they exchanged there. But they're actually exchanged in an encrypted form using the long-term key, so there's like some messiness, which I didn't want to get into. But just assume that magically the ephemeral keys are available. Yeah, details in the paper. Okay, now, uh, what's wrong with this? Uh, well, let's look at this in the external actor, so the weakest threat model. Um, there sh you should have a sense of deja vu here when you look at these two protocols side by side. So the client to server on the left and the end to the end on the right, what you notice is the same key pair is reused across both protocols on Alice's side, okay, in the, in the protocol. Um, and what's more, well, we don't have the same key here. Here we have PKS from the server, whereas in the end-to-end -end protocol we have PKB from Bob when we're constructing end-to-end uh, -end encrypted messages, okay? On the other hand, suppose the adversary could claim that its public key was PKS. PKS is public. It's encoded into the software, the Android software or whatever software, so you can extract it and you can say, this is my public key, and register that public key. Now, that's not so easy because the, uh, the registration process for the app requires you to prove knowledge of your private key. Okay, but I'll show you how to get around that later. So just, just roll with me for a while. Here's PKS now being registered by the user. Now what you see is that the key pair is, the, is identical in both protocols now. And so in particular, the key K message that's used for encrypting end-to-end -end messages will be the same as the key that's used to create the vouch box. So now uh, we have equal keys in these two places, as I just said. So now imagine that this message actually encodes an ephemeral public key 
for which the adversary knows the corresponding private key, then this end-to-end -end encrypted message actually becomes a vouch box for the client-to-server protocol. So you can take a message from the end-to-end -end protocol, if you can get Alice to encrypt it for you, and you can reuse it to, uh, in, the, in the C2S protocol. In particular, as I'll explain later, this enables you to break the authentication properties of the of the end-to-end -end protocol, of the C2S protocol, sorry, with bad consequences. Okay, so there's a big if. If MSG, if this message encodes a public key uh, for which the adversary knows the corresponding private key. So what does that mean? It means we need to come up with a key pair, and for the attack to work, we also need to know the ephemeral private key. It's not enough just to know the public key. We need a key pair for which the public key looks like that, right? We want the public key to be begin with a zero one byte, then to contain some sigma, which has to be a UTF-8 valid string of length 30 bytes. UTF-8 is required because the end-to-end -end protocol messages must be UTF-8 encoded. Okay, so this is one of those horrible real-world attack constraints that comes into play. And then it, we make it end with 01 because that's the shortest PKCS padding string that you can have. Okay? So the question is, can you come up with a key pair for which the public key has this format, a curve 25519 key pair? Any ideas? Yeah, we were also stumped. So what we did was we sampled about 2 to the 51 key pairs until we found a key pair with the correct property. We couldn't think of a way of generating things of this form in which you also knew the secret key or the private key without just generating random private keys and calculating the public key and hoping it has the right format. We couldn't think of a better way. And actually, our initial estimate was this would cost 50,000 core days on AWS, which is quite a big computation. Uh, so, you know, this is our, from our Slack channel. Um, this is Matteo telling me the bad news, and there's my reaction. But actually, um, Kien came up with some amazing optimizations, and we managed to cut the cost by a factor of about seven. We got it down to 8,100 core days. And we also used our local Euler supercomputer and we hacked the supercomputer to increase our quotas. <laughs> My, the guys, Matteo and Kien, are, uh, they're CTF players, and they're in the top, one of the world's top CTF teams. Uh, so it's quite handy having them on board. And there it is. And that's UTF-8 encoded. And it doesn't look, there's some wonderful characters in here. I don't even know what character set that's from. Is that maybe Sanskrit or some, maybe it's an Indian, Tele, Telugu maybe, or? Hindi. Indian, okay. Hindi. Ah, okay, thank you. So fantastic. Now, of course, um, how do you get a user to send you that, right? You need Alice to send Bob this, or Alice to send the adversary this message in order that you get then a properly constructed end-to-end -end encrypted message that you can use as a vouch box in the other protocol. Well, you encode it as a QR code, uh, okay, and I'll come to it in a moment, but you encode it as a QR code, and then you say to Alice, send me this QR code to win a prize. And of course, Alice will send it. Or some fraction of Alice's will send it, right? So you use social engineering to get users to send these messages for you. Okay. So as I mentioned, we also have this um, uh, account registration issue that we need to register PKS as, a, as the adversary's key in the end-to-end -end protocol to get the attack to work. And the normal account registration requires proof of possession of a private key. So what do we do there? That's tricky, but there is this thing called the Threema Gateway, which is a paid API, where you sign up and you pay, you buy Threema credits, minimum entry 100 Swiss francs, and then you can do additional things as a corporate customer. In particular, you can register accounts with arbitrary public keys without proof of possession. Because there's a web API for registering a public key, and it, you don't want to send your private key over the web, right? And they didn't re-implement the proof of possession protocol as part of that web app. Uh, so we registered, we set up an account and we registered PKS there, and it went through. 
And to, um, Threema later revoked this key when we informed them about our attacks, but they did refund us. They gave us back our credits. So we still have 100 francs worth of credits. If anybody wants them to use them for experimental purposes, please let me know. And just to prove that we did this, here is the public key of our, of our account, L-Y-T-A-A-A-S. Uh, and you can see that byte by byte, it matches the key that we extracted from the, from the code, right? So 045 for the first byte, 45 for the first byte, and so on. So these keys are identical. You might wonder what does L-Y-T-A-A-A-S stand for? It stands for losing your Threema account as a service. Okay, so now what do we do with all of this? I mentioned this part already. The server, the, the attacker says, my end-to-end -end public key is the server's public key. Please send me Sigma <coughs> as a text message to win a prize. That's that weird Sigma that I, met, that I showed you, encoded as a QR code. The adversary, uh, sorry, Alice does that. The first time, because the padding length is randomly chosen, the first time she happens to choose padding length two, and so it doesn't work. But then we get her to do it again, or another user does it, and we get 01, and it works, okay? So the success probability is one over 256, because there's 256 possible padding lengths, and only the shortest one works for us. But that's okay, I'm willing to accept a one over 256 probability of success, especially if I can target thousands of users at low cost. And by the way, all of the computation that we did is not you know, to recover the two to the 51 computation, is only, uh, um, is universal. It works for every user that we might want to attack. Okay, it's not, it's not a per user cost, it's a one-time cost. So if anybody wants our, I think I even gave you the private key. Uh, I won't go back, but if you, got, if you got a screenshot of that, you now have the private key, you can try these things out. Okay, good. So, good, so this works, and the attack works. We did the attack. Okay, so what's the impact? Well, an external attacker, a man in the middle attacker, can impersonate Alice to the server. This is a cross-protocol attack. These are quite rare, so it's quite interesting to see one of these in the wild. And sending a single text message then compromises client authentication forever, right? This vouch box that we create is actually good over and over again because there's no freshness check on ePKA in the protocol. There can't be. Okay, so once you've done this against Alice, you can reuse this over and over again. This leaks all communication metadata because now what, Alice, what the attacker can do is log in as Alice or authenticate as Alice and fetch all of the messages that are due to be delivered to Alice and then read all of the metadata. But it doesn't allow the attacker to break the end-to-end -end protocol. It's only breaking the C2S protocol. So we don't get the message content by this attack. However, it does break the forward security of the combined protocol. So if SKA ever leaks and you do this attack, then from the point of the attack onwards, all of A's old sent and received messages can be recovered by, by the attacker. And one of the nice things is that you can do the attack in a silent way, because you can download all of the messages, but you just don't acknowledge receipt of the messages, and then the server just keeps them for the next time the real Alice logs in. Okay, so you can silently check other new messages, get the metadata, and then if you happen to have SKA as well, you can then recover the message content. Okay, and this also enables a selective deletion attack because what you can do is acknowledge certain messages, message one and message three, for example, and then the next time Alice logs in, only message two will be delivered because the server thinks that message one and message three have already been delivered. So you can do selective message deletion and so on. Okay, so this is quite devastating. Um, so just to wrap up this case study, I've only covered one attack here. In total, we found seven different, seven different attacks in the three different threat models. And our, and our paper has all of the details. I'm not saying they're all fully practical or fully relevant, right? And we had quite a lot of public debate with Threema about the impact of this work. From a cryptographer's perspective, the collection of these vulnerabilities is quite devastating for Threema. It basically shows that their cryptographic design was really on shaky foundations. From a practical customer perspective, Threema were able to say, look, nothing to see here, everything is fixed now, nothing to worry about. So I don't think they lost any customers because of this, but um, it was a bit of a shaky moment for them, I think. 
So we disclosed the attacks to them in October 2022. They started fixing them right away and gradually released patches. And they also deployed a new forward secure end-to-end -end protocol, which has since been analyzed and has, has been shown to have some quite good security properties. So they have some kind of ratcheting now. And then we made our work public in January 2023. And we got some nice press coverage, including, uh, including this headline, which quotes me saying, the cryptography uh, lags years behind, um, which I think was fair uh, because it was using 2012 cryptography when much better things were available. Uh, but of course, um, Threema strongly objected to this uh, quote, but uh, I stand by it. So that was interesting. That was the first case study. I have eight minutes left. So we can do one of two things. I can skip the second case study, which is much more interesting, and just jump to the kind of discussion conclusion. Or I can quickly do the second case study and then do the conclusions and run until 10 minutes after my allocated time slot, till 11.30. So I'm going to turn my back. I learned this trick. <laughs> I learned this trick yesterday, and maybe Reza can, can run the poll. Who would like the second case study, and who would like early coffee? So, so Reza, can you do the necessary, please? <laughs> can I turn back around now? Okay, so what's the verdict? Continue. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks. Okay, so let's talk about Mega. And here it gets really, really fun. So what's Mega? Some of you know it. You're using it. It's massive. 280 million users. But I don't actually have a single friend who uses it. So I don't know. Maybe, it's, maybe these numbers are not completely solid. They claim to have more than 1,000 petabytes of stored data. Imagine you had to decrypt and then re-encrypt all of this data because your encryption algorithm was broken. OK, they have very strong security claims. In particular, they promise users that Mega cannot access user data. And they use this phrase, zero knowledge encryption. I have no idea what that is. But it, it's good, right? <clears throat> so let's get into it. How does it work? So it's pretty complicated. And I'm going to miss out a lot of details and just try to give you a high-level view and then point out some of the biggest issues. Um, so there's a 128-bit encryption key, KE, which is like the root of a key hierarchy. And that's derived directly from a user password or passphrase using a, a password-based key derivation function. So that part's good. Then uh, that's used to encrypt a master key, KM. And the master key is really core to all of the analysis that we're going to do. You can actually forget KE, really. We're going to focus on making bad things happen with KM. And KM, in turn, is used to encrypt file keys. Here are KF1, KF2, and so on, as well as RSA key pairs, an RSA key pair for each user, PKSK. So we're using good old RSA. Um, it's not RSA OAP. So it's, there's actually, in our first paper, there's a Blickenbacker style attack against this, but it's not practical, but still. It's old, old school crypto. And then this RSA key is used for file sharing. So if I want to share a file with someone else, I will encrypt the file key I've chosen, KF, under the RSA public key of the user that I want to share a file with. And now they can use their private key to decrypt, and they can recover the file key, and now they can decrypt the file. Okay, So a very standard kind of mechanism. Um, now, the keys, the encryption algorithms used for protecting the keys is all AES in ECB mode. How many of you know ECB mode? Not everybody. I'll show you ECB, ECB mode in a, in a few months' time. But you know already ECB mode is bad, right? Good, OK. And it's really bad. Uh, OK, so, oh, and this RSA key is not only used for file sharing, it's also used in the login and authentication protocol. So there's a key reuse happening here, which is useful for us in our attack, actually. OK, good. So how is the, do I need to do this? I guess I do. Here's how the RSA private key is stored. So users, here the thing is I should mention, users only know their password when they log in. 
and the server stores for the user um, everything else. Okay, the master key and uh, this, uh, yeah, the encrypted master key and the encrypted RSA private key are stored on the server on behalf of the user. So when the user logs in, the first thing that it does is fetch those encrypted keys, derive KE, and then use KE to recover KM, and then use KM to recover the private key. Okay, so the private key is always encrypted on the server, and here's the storage format. So we have prime factors P and Q. They're put in the order QP for some reason. Um, then we have D, this RSA secret exponent, and then we have this parameter U, which is Q inverse mod P. And Q inverse mod P is used in the RSA Chinese remainder theorem algorithm for decryption. So it allows you to speed up decryption. Um, so this is a useful thing to have around. And there are length fields. There are two byte length fields for each field, which means nothing is quite aligned with block boundaries of AESCCB, which is kind of annoying in the attacks, right? So uh, the block boundaries of AESCCB doesn't really line up with these fields. Um, and all of this is encrypted under the master key KM using AES ECB. So let me say something about ECB to remind you. I hope you recognize this little guy, one of our best friends. Here's what ECB does. It splits the message up into a sequence of blocks and it encrypts each block separately using the block cipher. Okay, to create a bunch of ciphertext blocks. And so if we apply this process to the penguin, you can still see the penguin. Okay, and this is why ECB, one of the reasons why ECB is bad. Uh, you can also switch blocks around and the user won't notice, right? They might mess up the message underlying the ciphertext, but still, you can manipulate stuff. Um, but on the other hand, keys are not penguins. This doesn't automatically allow you to recover the RSA private key, but it does hint that something might not be too good here. Here's the login procedure. You all got that, right? Good, we can move on. No, I'm joking. Let me explain it just a little bit. So the user issues a login request and they send their user ID. And the first thing that happens is Mega says, okay, let me find your encrypted master key and your encrypted private key and a user handle and I'll send them back to you. And I'll also send you an RSA ciphertext. I'm going to choose a random session ID, which is exactly 43 bytes long. I don't know why it's 43 bytes, but it is. Uh, and I'm going to encrypt it using RSA encryption along with your user handle, and um, I'm going to send you that. And what you're going to do is you're going to use your password to recover KE, you're going to use KE to recover the master key, you're going to use the master key to recover the private key, you're going to use the private key to decrypt the RSA ciphertext, and send me back the session ID that you get, or a failure symbol if something went wrong. Okay, so this is authenticating the client to the server by proving that you're able to use your RSA private key, by proving that you're able to recover your RSA private key and then use it to successfully decrypt. Okay, actually all of this is totally unnecessary because if you don't know the password, you can't recover KE and you can't recover the private key anyway. But maybe it helps with denial of service attacks or something. So, okay, this is what they do. Um, yeah, so I think I've said all of this. So what threat model do we want to use to analyze Mega? Well, we want to think about a malicious service provider who's trying to access customer data, right? So here we don't have any attacks in the kind of outsider attack model or man-in-the-middle adversary, um, but, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we're focusing on now malicious server. And that's fair because Mega said they were secure against the malicious server. You could trust, they, they couldn't read your data. And what we wanted to show is that actually they could, if they wanted to, with active attacks. And here I'm not so much thinking that Mega would ever do these attacks themselves, but you know, there are agencies out there in the world who specialize in breaking into servers and exploiting them, and stealing data from them and modifying their code and so on and so forth, right? We all know who those agencies are. They mostly have three letters. <laughs> NSAs, National Security Agencies. <coughs> okay, so our goal for these attacks is to obtain an ECB decryption capability under this master key KM. Because if we can do that, we can recover everything in this key hierarchy. We can recover file keys, 
and we re recover the private key of the user, the RSA private key. And once we've recovered the RSA private key, we can log in as the user, but we can also recover file keys that have been shared with that user in the past and into the future. Okay, so getting this ECB decryption capability is a, a powerful thing to have. And we want to figure out what does the attack cost, and here we want to minimize the amount of user interaction. So we want to measure the cost of the attack in terms of the number of logins that we need the user to engage in in order to complete the attack. Okay, of course there are other things we want to measure as well, like computational costs and so on, but those are all trivial, relatively trivial here. So number of logins is going to be our key criterion. So there are three papers in the last couple of years that analyzed MEGA. The first one was this one with uh, my colleagues at, uh, at ETH. And so Matilda is a PhD student in my group, and Miro was a master's student. And he's now a PhD student at UCSD with, with Nadia Henninger. Um, and here we found attacks. We had five different attacks against MEGA, so we did like a full analysis of MEGA. And the first uh, attack that we had was an RSA private key recovery attack that required 512 logins. Now that's a lot of user interaction. And when we disclosed this to MEGA, and they went and we, you know, they coordinated way, they published a blog about our attacks, one of the things they said is that from their logs, no user had ever logged in 512 times. So no user was ever at risk from our attacks. Shortly after our paper appeared, Nadia got inspired, and she wrote a paper that required only six logins. <laughs> at that point, Mega didn't say so much. But I should mention that their, Nadia and uh, Ryan, oh, sorry, Keegan's paper, which appeared at PKC 2023, um, was on the unpatched version. So our, our paper only became public, and they only started, Nadia and Keegan only started working on it after the system was already patched. So their attack didn't work anymore. But it did prove that maybe somebody else could have discovered an attack that only required six logins, right, before, earlier. Uh, and then the third paper, which appeared at Eurocrypt 2023 uh, with Martin, uh, Miro again, and now Lenka Marakova, who was a PhD student with Martin and is now a postdoc with me, uh, uh, we got it down to two logins. So we went from 512 to 6 to 2 in a negative amount of time. Why negative? Because these conferences are in the wrong order. Eurocrypt 2023 happened first, and then PKC, and then S&P. But the research was actually done in the opposite order. So it's quite, quite funny that that's how it worked out. Um, and actually, more importantly, the real point of this paper was to show that with the patches that had been done, we could still break it with about 2,500 logins. So the patching they had done was only able to slow down the original attacks that we had. It was a factor of five harder. So they didn't really help very much. I'm not going to talk very much about, I'm not going to talk at all about the 2,500 login attack. The ideas I think are really cool, but they're very hard to explain in, in, in this format. Yes, the question. Oh, that's a great question. Um, uh, I guess you could. Yeah, I guess you could. Um, you could, f by modifying the server code, make the client just do more logins. Yeah, yeah. But of course, users would eventually say, hey, I'm not using this crappy service anymore. So. Uh, no, because um, there's server authentication, and ev everything is running over TLS. Yeah, I didn't mention that, but yeah. Uh, that's really why we don't consider a man-in-the-middle attack. So we assume TLS is secure by now, so we're not going to we're not going to break it that way. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm super short of time. Let me just give you the core ideas now for how how we got down to two logins. Let's say. So first of all, we need we need two gadgets. We discovered an ECB encryption oracle, not decryption. We want a decryption oracle. We're going to get there, but first we got an encryption oracle. And it comes from this so-called mega drop feature, which is like a totally separate feature to do with file sharing. Um, when, when mega adds a new file into a user's file store, maybe because of sharing by another user, the, the, the file key is initially encrypted under the public key of the user, the RSA public key. But this information is sent to the user, and the user decrypts the, uh, using the RSA private key and then re-encrypts the file key under the master key. 
So it goes from a public key encryption to a symmetric key encryption, and then uploads this to the server. And the reason is efficiency, because eventually you only want to do symmetric key operations. You want all your file keys to be encrypted under the master key anyway, so this makes a lot of sense. But now the attacker, the server as attacker, can choose KF arbitrarily in the, in the first flow because it's public key encryption. Okay, you can choose the plain text, and now we'll get back an encryption of that plain text under the master key. This gives you an ECB, and the encryption is ECB. Okay, and it actually gives you two ECB blocks for each file key that you choose because of the format of file keys. Does that make sense? It's a little bit tricky maybe, but okay, good. So we have an encryption oracle. Now I'm going to show you a decryption oracle by exploiting the login protocol. And this allows us to recover two ECB blocks per login. Okay, so here's the original protocol. And I don't expect you to understand this in detail right away. I just want to give you a flavor. Um, but what you do is you overwrite the public key of the user in such a way that you, uh, you know Q and P and D, and U is no longer a valid value, but it, it's overwritten with the two ECB blocks that you want to recover in the most significant byte positions. Okay, so there's some magic going on here about where we place the blocks that we want to decrypt. Okay, so remember, this is actually ECB encrypted. We, we choose some of the blocks using the encryption oracle, and then we drop in the two blocks that we want to get decrypted into the right position. And then we change the ciphertext that we send to be encryption of a special message M star, which is equal to Q times U, where U is the correct value of U for this public key, and we send this. And then it turns out that the RSA CRT decryption is going to use this U dagger in place of U. And it turns out that that means the session ID contain, contains bytes of Q times U dagger, where U dagger is this chosen value. So this gets sent back. And now we can post-process this SID prime value, and we can recover two target plain text blocks. So it's a 43-byte value, but it's multiplied by Q, and so we have to divide by Q and then somehow extract the value of U dagger from the most significant byte positions. And it's not completely clear how you do that. All I want to say is math. Okay? This works. So every time you run the login protocol, the server can extract two blocks of plain text from arbitrarily encrypted ECB ciphertext. Okay, let's put it all together and then I'm almost done. We use the ECP encryption oracle to overwrite the private key with a completely known RSA private key. Then we use the ECP decryption oracle four times to recover all eight blocks of the original queue. Okay? This doesn't actually work. It would require four logins, which is still better than Keegan and Nadia six, but you know, we want to do better. And actually, it doesn't quite work because of bad block alignments, right? You wouldn't actually get all of the, all of the bytes of Q this way. But you could always get, guess the last 16 bits of Q. Those lie in the ninth ECB block. And that's because of this two-byte length field here, which is kind of annoying. OK. So uh, instead, we do something slightly smarter. We recover the last four full blocks of Q using two logins. That gives us 512 bits of Q. For each guess of the last 16 least significant bytes of Q, we can now build the 528 least significant bits sorry, of Q, and then use a lattice attack to recover the rest of Q. And this is a completely standard lattice attack by now, well known that if you know the least significant bits of Q, you can recover all of Q, okay? If you know enough of the least significant bits. And roughly speaking, half of the LSBs are sufficient. And so the worst case complexity of this attack is we have to run LLL 2 to the 16 times in small dimension. And this takes a few hours. And it's distributed, it can be trivially parallelized. So we did this, and it works. So this, this is how we get the cost down to two logins, because we only need four full blocks, and we get two blocks for each login. So there's an open problem. Can you find an attack that only requires one login? 
as you pointed out, maybe you can anyway force two logins just by pretending the first one failed. Um, but I think it's only a theoretical interest because of course by now Mega is patched. Okay? So uh, just to kind of start wrapping up, here's the Mega decryption process now in the patch code after our first attacks. And it turns out that what they did was they added extra validity checking to try and prevent our first attacks. But for everything that can go wrong in the validity checks, they send a distinguishable error message. And this is really bad. It's well known that decryption processes being chatty about what errors are occurring during processing is bad for security. So it turns out that we're able to exploit this to come up with these new attacks that require about 2,500 logins. And uh, I won't go through the details now, but uh, read, read about them in our paper if you're interested. So we disclosed all of this to Mega. They actually then finally decided to do a major redesign. So in the first phase, they just did this patching that didn't really work, but now they've done something more uh, significant to patch against the attacks. And the upgrade took place back in March. Um, they gave us a bug bounty, which is very nice, and they updated their security blog. What was very clever was they portrayed the new attacks as part of the previous set of attacks. Uh, so that that then underplayed the fact that their previous ad hoc fixes had not been successful. And this is very smart marketing, I must say. Okay, good. So um, I'm actually out of time. Um, and so I'm probably going to have to skip this part, which talks about why, why can this be difficult? Uh, why, why can it be rewarding? So let me, let me actually skip a few slides here. I'll skip this stuff too. Talk to me in the break about this if you're interested. Here's why you should do it, and then I'll, I'll probably stop. It's fun. I hope you sense my enthusiasm for this kind of work. And you might find novel attack vectors that are applicable elsewhere too. It's a great tool for engaging students. Master students in particular, ETH at least, love doing this kind of work. It's tough, but if you pick the right targets, they can find stuff and they can disclose and they can learn all about the disclosure process and they can write papers and they have the full experience. It actually does lead to improvements in the quality of deployed cryptography one system at a time. Okay, that's a bit painful. And it provides teachable moments in the classroom. So often when we teach cryptography, we teach one-way functions, imply PRFs, imply PRPs, imply symmetric encryption, and it's great, it's really foundational, our students need to know that stuff. But isn't it also useful if we think of them as future software engineers, that they should learn why key reuse is really bad and have a concrete example that makes it clear why it's really bad, rather than just some abstract explanation that the security proof doesn't go through? Nonce handling is critical. We saw that in Threema. Compression before encryption leads to side channels. We had an attack against Thema based on its use of compression for the backups. Okay, it's a very nice attack, not very practical, but it's beautiful um, and teachable. Don't roll your own cryptographic algorithms. I didn't illustrate that today, but some, there are cases of that in our work. Don't roll your own cryptographic protocols. That's now the next version of that, right? Then the question is, who should roll cryptographic protocols? Well companies should engage experts to do that kind of work. Or they should employ people. Maybe they should employ some of these cryptographers that we're training to do this work for them because if you get it wrong, it can be very messy, etc. So that's why you should do it. Why you shouldn't do it, we talked about it a little bit. It's complicated, it's messy. The scientific community doesn't always appreciate it. But when it does, you can win best paper awards. So there's another incentive to do this work. Okay, I've taken up far too much of your time. Thank you for indulging me, and thank you for being such a great audience. I'll see you in the break. Thanks. Thank you, Kenny. Just in case, if there are no, maybe one or two questions. Go ahead. Can you speak more loudly? Sorry, I you're quite far away. Right, 
Yeah. That's an interesting idea. So you're saying the server functionality would run in SGX, yeah. and then clients could get an assurance that the server isn't deviating from the agreed protocol in some way. Yeah. Yes. Yes, that can help. Uh, but it does require uh, clients to understand, or users to understand, what does it mean that an SGX authorization has succeeded, or an authentication has, you know, validation has succeeded, and so on. Or the app just stops working, right? Uh, so there's like there then become kind of user interaction issues that you have to deal with. But in principle, yeah, that can help definitely. There's a whole other class of attacks I didn't talk about here either, which is that very often in the particularly in the web-based versions of the apps, the server is sending the code to the client. So the server can just send garbage code, which maybe just sends the once the user has in Mega once the user has recovered their private key, just sends the private key directly back to the server. Right, so you can, you know, that's a threat that's somehow so uh, severe, but also so trivial to to realize that we don't even consider it as a, as an attack. And you assume that maybe something like code transparency or SGX would uh, would take care of that. Um, absolutely. So no, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another motivation for doing research on SGX. I mean, it works extremely well in the sense that um, once you have a, if you're in proof mode and you build the right kind of model, instead of it being a pseudocode model, it can be a Tamarin model or a ProVerif model. And then you hit verify. And then, well, then you need a, an expert for one of those systems to help you guide it to do a proof. We don't use Tamarin or ProVerif very much. Uh, when we're doing, when we're in proof mode, we're much more doing game-based security proofs in, that are computationally sound. Uh, but ProVerif and Tamarin and tools like that, there are many such tools now, are, are really, really useful for verifying bigger protocols, more complex protocols with many interacting components. Because like the hand-generated uh, cryptographic proofs don't really scale well to that kind of, that kind of size. So absolutely, the, the proof approach can also involve automated provers. But I'm, I'm, always very, I'm always a little bit cautious about symbolic proofs because you know, they have known limitations, right? They're, they're, they're idealizing the cryptography. On the other hand, they do more. Thank you. 